You wouldn't think so. But a bromance budding between a cheeky demon lord and a brave and dashing hero has gotten a surprising amount of play over the years. But there's at least one Satan Sword Boy ship you might have missed. 2009's Eroge turned PS3 game adaptation, Tears of Tiara, features a millennia spanning bromance as a mashup between the King Arthur mythos and the Old Testament, as seen through the eyes of elf lollies because anime. I'm Green Tea Gal, and this is Romantic Subtext. Leave it up to anime to essentially ship Arthur and Merlin together. This BL ship sails through some turbulent waters at first. Aron, the OP demon lord here to solve other people's problems one ass whooping at a time, is suddenly awakened and presented with a sacrifice in exchange for the safety of the Gale tribe. But in a Shyamalan twist, the gift wife of Rhiannon becomes his self-appointed actual wife instead. And Arthur, yes, that Arthur, the brave but prickly first knight and future king of the Gale tribe, and wife's brother, just can't abide demon lord involvement. He flips that I won't accept you soon to switch on pretty much immediately. No, 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 absolutely not! As your brother, I will not allow it! Aron, on the other hand, is already on board with presiding over the Gale tribe, and is keen to work with Arthur in particular. I wonder why. Speaking of first impressions, we need to unpack these opening credits. Let needlessly sexy green tea sensei tell you about apples. Turns out apples are another subtle instance of BL and sexual symbolism, right up there with butthole roses and the very obvious rainbows. Other than the fact this apple exchange is an indirect kiss, apples themselves tend to represent the biblical interpretation of forbidden fruit, adopted by anime to sneakily represent a desire to indulge in gay lust. <sighs> now this isn't a new trope at all, it's new to me. Because I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen this in anime and never even thought twice about it. Earth calling Joe, you listening? Oh, now why'd you go and waste it? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Grand of Grand Blue Fantasy and his bestie, who's clearly in love with him, are what opened my eyes to this trope. Apples are in every scene and every flashback they're in together. When Destiny calls and Grant has to go on an RPG quest, Destiny feels lonely and left behind. And later, when they promise to reunite after his anime hero's journey is over, apples are always shown. Rito of Healer's Kyoto is out harvesting apples just before he gets his powers and put on the path to his great filled destiny. That I remind you, he actively puts himself through twice as he lets maids and soldiers clap his cheeks for an additional six months. Favado flirting with Kaiser during their battle in Rage of Bahamut episode 1? The episode of Sayuki where Goku decides to become a peeping Tom and on a guy who's pledged his life to another man? Apple again. In Requiem of the Rose King, when Richard III meets his first boyfriend, King Henry, in the woods, where they plan their doomed future together, he fetches them some apples. And later, just as Richard's trying to decide if he wants to fight to keep his crown or run back to the arms of his hot but controlling top Buckingham, a meaningful show to Prince hands him an apple. A character being introduced to eating an apple is also a subtle way of saying they're gay or bi without explicitly saying so. Hiroshi from Full Dive RPG meets the hot bestie whose death literally haunts him for the rest of the show. What's the first thing they do after meeting in episode 1? Mm -hmm. And I wonder what was going on in Record of Ragnarok when Adam kept eating the forbidden fruit, especially during Eve's trial. But he always spits it out in disdain, yelling it was sour, and I was like, how though? Apples are one of the sweetest fruits in the world and- oh. Oh! So sour. When he kept spitting instead of swallowing, with each apple representing one sin, he didn't actually mean the apples were sour. Jesus, they snuck a funky sp joke right past me and I was caught slipping! Anyway, back on topic. Arwan's castle is lousy with apple trees, and when he finally comes home after a millennia away, his elf maids roasting apples is the first thing he sees when he walks through the door. Okay, now I swear I'm done with the apple bit. The anime spends a reasonable amount of time having the boys be sundere at each other, but you can already tell how close Arwan and Arthur are going to be later. Arthur's hesitance working with the demon finally melts away after a one-on-one -on -one duel at night that Arthur promptly loses. By episode 5, Arthur is like his naggy wife, constantly browbeating Arwan about the particulars of Galian culture. The anime jumps back and forth between Arthur's culture shock 
and our own Art of War advice. They're like a well-oiled machine on the battlefield as well, tag-teaming whole armies and coordinating daring escapes, etc. Despite the large cast, only Arthur ever calls Aron by his name with no honorifics. Aron! They're arguably closer to each other than anyone else in the show. They squabble like an old married couple, and do that physical tough love thing only guys can get away with. But at the end of the day, they constantly lift each other up, sometimes literally. And even though the wife was around them were all capable fighters, in episode 13, Aron wages his own head during the minstrel's duel, trusting Arthur and only Arthur with his life. If you couldn't tell, Tears to Tiara is at its core a war anime, and war, well real wars of the time, tended to be mostly male endeavors. But because anime, more and more out of place looking 100 pound waifus are yeeted into battle into what's otherwise a semi-historical drama. The screen time these waifus get needs to be divided among at least five girls at any given time. I forgot several of them even existed between my first and second viewing. Most of their lines seem like just an excuse to have them on screen, so they literally feel like filler. There's some exceptions, of course, but plot doesn't make much time for waifu character development. And drinks too much, and talks too loud, and wears too little doesn't count. If anything's driving the actual story forward, it's usually the dudes, with everything and everyone else a distant second. For a horror fantasy with this many waifus, hetero romance is glaringly absent. The anime is kicked off Rhiannon, being reduced to a sacrificial lamb to revive Demon Lord Aron and save the tribe. After calling herself Aron's wife immediately after not being eaten alive, she tends to be pushed into the role of emotional support animal or plot device, also healer. Her marriage to Aron is purely ceremonial, it seems, as they never quite form anything really resembling a romantic or sexual relationship. I think the show noticed their general lack of chemistry, because episode 12 pulls a their hearts are connected plot point out of its ass when she goes missing so she actually has something to do. Their hearts are connected? What does that mean? The other women who call themselves his wives also have decided that entirely on their own before getting clinging exactly once each and then never again. I will work hard my Lord of Ron's side for the rest of my life! As you can see, he's thrilled. I don't get a flesh wound in episode 3 and it won't stop bleeding. Yannan and Morgan both assume licking his wounds will cure it somehow, but an actual doctor arrives and Aron fries his hand away and shakes off their affection like slobbery kisses from a happy dog. The anime makes a show of a man having to step in to help him, even though Yannan has healing powers. On second viewing, I notice Aron and Arthur are annoyed or flat out harassed by most of the women in their orbit, at least for the first half of the show. And that only stops because they're usually nowhere near each other during the second half of the show. The flood of pervy shenanigans and fan service typical of the genre are mere sprinkles at best here. It's around episode 14 you realize Medieval Times' most eligible bachelor is married and surrounded by women, but sleeps alone every night. I remind you, this franchise started out as an eroge, but barely any of that lewdness made it into its multiple adaptations. Now where have I heard that before? The complete defiance of its etchy roots, Neither Aron nor Arthur ever show any real romantic or sexual interest in any of the waifus. Arthur used to seem kinda into Morgan, but you can count on one hand the number of times he even speaks to her past episode 6. Later in the show, she gets shipped with sword waifu Octavia instead. Yes, really. They pal around, tag team their own battles, wear matching jewelry, and hold hands just to make sure they get the point across. The closest thing this anime ever gets to a hetero romance is the sex pest minstrel and his lolly lust. At best, Aron protects or treats the girls like his children or his responsibility, unlike Arthur, who he treats much more like an equal. Once Morgan's off the menu, there really isn't even an attempt to ship Arthur with anyone else. Best Boy is all about that day job and making battle strategies that Aron would approve of. I swear he throws himself in harm's way just to see Aron smile. Smile, Gurney. I am smiling. If you've ever wondered why I always include a section about the women in these videos, it's because there's no BL like the kind where there are perfectly good women present, and the MC still chooses a guy over them anyway. But like all good BL couples, they still need some contrived drama. After Ron saves them with his divine power in episode 15, he resembles the man who killed Arthur's father years prior. Ignoring the fact that Aron was in a coma at the time, or the possibility that there's been more than one divine being on Earth in the past decade, Arthur's convinced he's finally found his father's killer, so naturally, he flies into a blind rage. You push you who murdered him. The person who killed my father was you! Do you deny it or not? 
I don't could have blocked the sword or pushed Rion on out of the way. Or heck, use force lighting to roast Arthur back to his senses. But he just lets Arthur run him through instead. Instant regret after stab into your boyfriend in the blind rage. Starter pack. Oh, could I? It's fine. It is extremely not fine. He lets Arthur stab him in that toxic, it's okay if it's you sort of way. I don't even praises him afterwards. I'm so proud of you. They have a surprisingly tender moment and whisper to each other before Aron collapses. The scene is equal parts romantic and cringe. The real Slim Shady is eventually revealed, and we find out later he brainwashed Arthur into playing out this melodrama. Horrified at what he's done to his husbando, Arthur wanders off, and Aron falls into another coma, and not one of his waifus can wake him. Sounds familiar. Aron literally will not get out of bed until Arthur returns leaving their tribe without a general or commander-in-chief at the brink of war. But at least Rhiannon's finally given something to do. After going on a violent spirit quest with pig orcs, don't ask, Arthur's the last to realize aron has been his battle BFF this whole time. My friend and comrade. So he hurries back to be by his base side once again. A little wiser and with reinforcements in tow. Then he makes the most over-the-top return ever. Are you listening to me? Bitch, shut up. Guess who finally wakes his ass up? There's no need to shout, you know? Part of the reason Arthur and Aron are such bosom buddies is that Arthur is the direct reincarnation of Quill, the elf king and Aron's first and dearest friend. You know, that guy he's low-key checking out in the opening credits? He and Quill met in a forest and immediately decided to work together to make Earth great again with their combined power and compassion. Speaking of power... It's long past time we saw this magic of which you're so proud. We get glimpses of Aron's divine past in episode 15. Demon Lord Aron was, is, actually fallen angel Lucifer, waging his own personal holy war to protect humans and the Earth from divine intervention, aka angels. The Old Testament smiting, pillar of salt genocide angels. Up the corner of our hopes and dreams! Will and Aron got super close while defying the heavens, but Aron is critically wounded and must fall into Odin's sleep to heal. But before that, he pledged an eternal friendship with Quill. This way, they could be reunited somehow when he's healed. But by the time Aron's revived, Quill is long gone. Or is he? Romance may have just been in the cars for Aron because even before meeting Quill and Arthur, he was born, raised, and lived for centuries exclusively with men. Later, when he leaves heaven and builds new relationships, he seems to hold his connection with one specific man on Earth in particular in the highest regard, where he pledges to keep falling into a partnership with a cute anime sword boy destined for greatness, with any wife who has so much set dressing. And while yes, this little girl in their flashbacks is Rhiannon's ancestor, and the only thing keeping Aron's previous life from becoming a complete and utter sausage fest, she's also a reminder of the literal child he adopted, while Arthur is the next best thing to his bestie or equal he misses terribly. So you can kind of see why the show waits until after the day is saved in episode 26 to delve into this portion of the main character's backstory. As if Arthur and Aron needed the excuse of reincarnation or Aron's grooming to be the future king to explain their closeness. Anyway, for the finale, the us against the world dynamic reaches critical mass. They whip out their matching glowing swords and tag team the f out of this evil angel turned Book of Revelations monstrosity. They ride dragons and there's fireballs and lightning. It's the best. And Rihanna enchants an incantation to put that awful thing in the ground for good. Brick Angel gets his comeuppance too. But the battle won and Earth saved, again. Only then are Aron, Arthur, and Pwill allowed to have a tender moment. Aron and Arthur are tight and all, but I don't think he ever completely gets over Pwill, whose ghost he finally gets to see and speak to through Arthur. Aron agrees to always be by Arthur's side and guide him to his royal destiny, as if he wasn't already planning to do that from the start. They use the word friend a lot, but the depth of the bond he forms with Pool and Arthur is more like life partner or soulmate. Aron is biologically immortal, so it's a way bigger deal for him to pledge or tie himself to anyone, let alone for all of their lifetimes. So let's fast forward a bit, and Arthur lives up to his name and really becomes the little king. Yoku <laughs> 
Faron is referred to as Big King. They even make their currency with both their faces on the coins. And their royal romance is once again immortalized by elf lollies, as was customary for the time.